my opening statement, Mr. Chairman, I did want to raise a separate issue with you. Uh, last week at our hearing, <clears throat> you made a, with our witness, you made a, I, I think, a good point. You said to the witness that if he misled this Congress, that you were going to hold him accountable. Mr. Meadows and I sent a letter to the Justice Department highlighting at least six times where we felt the witness did just that, misled this Congress and made false statements. Last night, the Wall Street Journal reported at 11.56 p.m. that Mr. Cohen told his lawyer to seek a pardon from the President. When Mr. Cohen was here last week, he said, I have never asked for nor would I accept a pardon from the President. Clearly another lie. So now we are up to seven. And I am just wondering what the Chairman plans to do after his statement last week to the witness where he said, if you come here and say things that are not accurate, I will hold you accountable. No, uh, no, that is not what I said. I said I will nail you to the cross. <laughs> that is what I said. Um, you, if you haven't learned anything about me. Well, I am asking I'm, no, what, no, that, no, what does I, that mean? I am going to answer your question now. Let me be clear. I do things in a very deliberate and very careful manner. I believe in integrity and carefulness. I have read your letter. I am going through the transcript and I will make decisions and I will consult with you. All right. Are you finished? Were you finished? No, I got my opening statement. Oh, oh I thought you were finished. Okay, go ahead. No, I made clear, Mr. Chairman, well, that I, I want to ask you. I think it is important, just like you said, that when witnesses well, I, come in front of the Congress, they are answered, honest with you. I just answered you. Didn't I just answer you? You said you are going to do something. You didn't say yeah, what you are going right. to do. I said that, again, let me say it slowly. I am a very deliberate and careful person. I believe in integrity. I refuse to do what I have been seen done in, in this committee over the years, where people go out and make headlines, and then we have a hearing trying to, trying to come up with the facts to match it. I will do it. I will, take, I will take my time, go through it, because I want credibility with the American people. And so do I. All right, that is it. So do I, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I almost don't know where to start almost don't know where to begin. Ten days ago, on a Saturday, you scheduled a transcribed interview with Ms. Newbold on a Saturday and didn't tell the Republicans until the day before. 3.30 the day before, you schedule a 8.30 a.m. interview for the very next day. At the organizational meeting of this committee, you pledged you would not do that. You said closed-door testimony would be done so that members could attend, but you pick a Saturday on a week we're not even in session and tell us the day before. And then yesterday, yesterday you issue a press release, hand-pick, cherry-pick parts of her testimony, Ms. Newbold's testimony, and you issue a big memo and a big press release after interviewing one witness. That's how we're going to do investigations in the Oversight Committee? Talk to one person and then issue a big press statement so you can get some headlines? First a Saturday deposition, then yesterday a press release after talking to just one witness where you handpick a few parts of her testimony, and now today, now today we are going to subpoena a guy who just sent us a letter saying he is willing to come here voluntarily. I have been on this committee 10 years. I have never seen anything like this. Oh, please. Never seen anything like this. I have not Yeah, you have done it. I have not I'll tell you what else I have never seen. <laughs> I tell you what else I have never seen. I have never seen a witness come in front of this committee and lie to us seven times and us not as a committee do something about it. We won't do anything about. Uh, no, no more Wilbur Ross statements, please. We won't do anything about a guy who lied to us seven times, but we will schedule a deposition on a Saturday of a week we are not here, notify the minority the day before do a press release yesterday after talking to just one witness, and then subpoena somebody who's already agreed to come voluntarily. That's how this committee is going to operate. And frankly, it gets worse, because we got another resolution with three more subpoenas. Three more subpoenas, one to the Commerce Department for documents, one to the Justice Department for documents, and one to a witness who's already come and set for a transcribed interview, Mr. Gore. The Commerce Department has given us over 11,000 documents. Just three weeks ago, the Secretary of Commerce came here 
Mr. Ross, 82-year-old Mr. Ross, came here and answered questions for over six hours. But that's not good enough. We're going to subpoena documents from commerce, from justice, and now subpoena Mr. Gore, who's already set for a transcribed interview. And why are we going to do that? Why are we going to do that? Because the Democrats want to interfere with the court case. Three weeks from today, the Supreme Court's going to hear arguments about a simple question. Should, on the census, should we ask people if they're citizens of this great country? The Democrats say no. Most Americans think we're already doing it because we are. But the Democrats want to interfere with the court case. And you know why we know they want to interfere in the court case, with the court case? Because they said so. A, member of the Dem a mem Democrat member of this committee said, we want to do all this because we want information, quote, that the courts can use. That is as wrong as it gets. So we can't, we can't take action for a guy who lied to us, their first big witness at their first announced big no uh, uh, hearing. Get it right. We can't take action as a committee for a guy who lied to us seven times, but we're going to, we're going to interfere with a court case because we want information to help us in this decision not to put a simple question on the census. This is wrong. I urge, I urge all, all members to oppose both resolutions, to oppose all these subpoenas. Let's have this committee operate the way it's supposed to. Let's do the kind of investigations we're supposed to and historically have done. I urge a no vote on both resolutions. And I would yield now to the gentleman from concerning a home equity line of credit, taxi medallions, and your Park Avenue apartment in 2013, 2014, and 2015, and you pled guilty to making those false statements to those banks, was that all done to protect the President? No, it was not. How about this one? When you created the fake Twitter account, Women for Cohen, and paid a firm to post tweets like this one, in a world of lies, deception, and fraud, we appreciate this honest guy at Michael Cohen Hashtag TGIF, hashtag handsome, hashtag sexy. Was that done to protect the president? Uh, Mr. Jordan, I didn't actually set that up. It was done by a young lady that worked for Redfinch. And during the course of the campaign, which you would know gets somewhat crazy and wild, we were having fun. That's what it was, sir. We were having fun. Was it done to protect the president? That was not done to protect the president. Was it a fake Twitter account? That was. No, that was a real Twitter account. It you exists. You pay a firm to create this Twitter I didn't account pay the firm to do Cohen. that. It was done by a young lady that works for the firm. And again, sir, we were having fun during a stressful time. The point is, Mr. Cohen, did you lie to protect the president or did you lie to help yourself? I'm not sure how that helped me, sir. I'm not sure how it did either. Right. And the I would like to I also note that more than half the people and, and on that site point. are men. Here's the point. The chairman <laughs> just gave you a 30-minute opening statement. And you have a history of lying over and over and over again. And frankly, you don't take my word for it. Take what the court said. Take what the Southern District of New York said. Cohen did crimes that were marked by a pattern of deception and that permeated his professional life. These crimes were distinct in their harms but bear a common set of circumstances. They each involved deception and were each each motivated by personal greed and ambition. A pattern of deception for personal greed and ambition. And you just got 30 minutes of an opening statement where you trashed the President of the United States of America. Mr. Cohen, how long did, how long did you work for Donald Trump? Approximately a decade. Ten years? That's correct. And you said all these bad things about the President there in that last 30 minutes, and yet you worked for him for 10 years? All those bad things, I mean, if it's that bad, I can see you working for him for 10 days, maybe 10 weeks, maybe even 10 months. But you worked for him for 10 years. Mr. Cohen, how, how, long, did you, uh, how long did you work in the White House? I never worked in the White House. And that's the point, isn't it, Mr. Cohen? No, sir. Yes, it is. No, it's not, sir. You wanted to work in the White House. No, you sir. You didn't get brought to the dance. Sir. And now? I was extremely proud to be personal attorney to the President of the United States of America. I did not want to go to the White House. I was offered jobs. I can tell you a story of Mr. Trump reaming out Reince Priebus because I had not taken a job 
where Mr. Trump wanted me to, which is working with Don McGahn at the White House General Counsel's Office. Mr. Cohen, office. you work for the sir, President. Sir, one, one, one second. All right. What I said at the time, and I brought a lawyer in who produced a memo as to why I should not go in because there would be no attorney-client privilege. And in order to handle Mr. some Cohen? of the matters that I talked about in my opening, that it would be best suited for me not to go in, and that every president had a personal Cohen, here's attorney. What I see. Here's what I see. I see a guy who worked for 10 years and is here trashing the guy he worked for for 10 years, didn't get a job in the White House, and now, and now you're, you're behaving just like everyone else who's got fired or didn't get the job they wanted, like Andy McCabe, like James Comey, same kind of selfish motivation after you don't get the thing you want. That's what I see here today, and I think that's what the American people Mr. Do. Jordan, all I wanted was what I got, to be personal attorney to the president, to enjoy the senior You're year of my anymore, son in high school and waiting for my daughter, who is graduating from college, to come back to New York. I got exactly what I want. Gentlemen, exactly what you want? What I wanted. That's right. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I received time. exactly right. what I wanted. Gentlemen, time has expired. Here we go. Your first big hearing, your first announced witness, Michael Cohen. I want everyone in this room to think about this. The first announced witness for the 116th Congress is a guy who is going to prison in two months for lying to Congress. Mr. Chairman, your chairmanship will always be identified with this hearing. And we all need to understand what this is. This is the Michael Cohen hearing presented by Lanny Davis. That's right. Lanny Davis choreographed the whole darn thing. The Clinton's best friend, loyalist, operative, Lanny Davis put this all together. You know how we know? He told our staff. He told the committee staff. He said the hearing was his idea. He selected this committee. He had to talk Michael Cohen into coming. And most importantly, he had to persuade the chairman to actually have it. He told us it took two months to get that job done. But here we are. He talked him into it. This might be the first time someone co convicted of lying to Congress has appeared again so quickly in front of Congress. Certainly it's the first time a convicted perjurer has been brought back to be a star witness in a hearing. And there's a reason this is the first, because no other committee would do it. Think about this. With Mr. Cohen here, this committee, we got lots of lawyers on this committee. This committee is actually a encouraging a witness to violate attorney-client privilege. Mr. Chairman, when we legitimize dishonesty, we delegitimize this institution. We're supposed to pursue the truth, but you have stacked the deck against the truth. We're only allowed to ask certain questions. Even with that amendment you just told us about, well, Russ is now on the table. You initially told us we can't ask questions about the special counsel, can't ask questions about the Southern District of New York, can't ask questions about Russia. Nope. Nope. Only subjects we can talk about are ones you think are going to be harmful to the President of the United States. And the answers to those questions are going to come from a guy who can't be trusted. Here's what the U.S. Attorney said about Mr. Cohen. While Mr. Cohen enjoyed a privileged life, his desire for ever greater wealth and influence precipitated an extensive course of criminal conduct. Mr. Cohen committed four four distinct federal crimes over a period of several years. He was motivated to do so by personal greed and repeatedly, repeatedly used his power and influence for deceptive ends. But the Democrats don't care. They don't care. They just want to use you, Mr. Cohen. You're their patsy today. They got to find somebody, somewhere, to say something so they can try to remove the president from office because Tom Steyer told him to. Tom Steyer, last week, organized a town hall. Guess where? Chairman Nadler's district in Manhattan. Two nights ago, Tom Steyer organized a town hall. Guess where? Chairman Cummings district in Baltimore. The best they can find, the best they can find to start this process, Michael Cohen. Fraudster, a cheat, convicted felon, and in two months, a federal inmate. Well, actually, they didn't find him. Lanny Davis found him. I'll say one thing about the Democrats. They stick to the playbook. Remember, remember how all this started. The Clinton campaign hired Perkins Coie Law Firm, 
who hired Glenn Simpson, who hired a foreigner, Christopher Steele, who put together the fake dossier that the FBI used to go get a warrant to spy on the Trump campaign. But when that whole scheme failed and the American people said, we're going to make Donald Trump president, they said, we got to do something else. So now, Clinton loyalist, Clinton operative, Lanny Davis, has persuaded the chairman of the Oversight Committee to give a convicted felon a forum to tell stories and lie about the President of the United States so they can all start their impeachment process. Mr. Chairman, we are better than this. We are better than this.